So, um, despite our older son's strongest possible objections, last summer we sent him on a 22-day mountaineering expedition with Outward Bound. Oh, he complained bitterly about having to go. But as it got closer, and we were clearly not backing down, he did finally resign himself to going. He was pretty nervous about it. He was not sure he had what it took to uh, climb those peaks and, and be in the wilderness for that long a period of time. But I had great confidence in him, and when he came back, he was eager to share with us some of the things he had learned. One of the things he shared with us early on of what he had learned is that if you are uh, out in the wilderness and Everything you have with you is soaking wet. Your socks, your underwear, your clothes, even your sleeping bag. Uh, you can actually partially dry out your wet socks uh, after you wring the water out of them. You get into your sleeping bag and you put them in your armpits. And uh, apparently overnight, the heat from your body will actually help drive some of the water from them and makes it much more pleasant to put them back on your feet the next day. <laughs> it's one of the things he learned. He learned that no matter how independent you might aspire to be or like to think of yourself, he said, um, you have to realize that you probably could not survive 22 days in the wilderness and climb uh, three or four 14,000 foot peaks without a whole lot of human cooperation and human and, and teamwork and support from other people. And he learned, and I, I love this, I've shared this a couple times in a couple different places, at least the way Outward Bound defines this, um, they say, you know, every situation is fun in one way or another, and, and they teach that there are five kinds of fun. The first kind of fun is where everybody's having a good time and everybody knows they're having a good time right in that moment. The second type of fun is where you think you're, right in the moment, you don't think you're having a good time. In fact, you're pretty sure you're not having a good time. But later, when you look back on it, you realize, oh, I really was having a good time right then. The third type of fun is when uh, you're having fun, but nobody else is having fun. <laughs> now, that can, in fact, overlap with number two, because later you might look back and realize that you were, the other people were, in fact, having fun. And the fourth kind of fun is when everybody else is having fun, but you are not having fun. <laughs> and that, of course, can overlap with number two as well. You could look back later and realize that you were, in fact, having fun. The fifth kind of fun, and this is where I think the whole fun definition gets stretched a little bit, is, is fifth kind of fun is where nobody's having fun 
and you all know that you're not having fun. And even when you look back on it, you realize that was really, really not fun. <laughs> so he was actually very pleased with himself when he did come back from this 22-day expedition and, uh, and was perfectly willing to share that, in fact, on, on, well, he did not think he was having fun when he was uh, you know, trudging uphill at 2 o'clock in the morning with a 50-pound pack in the pouring rain. When he looked back on the whole trip, the whole thing absolutely, without question, fell into the second category of fun, which is that it didn't seem like it was fun, but looking back, it was really quite an amazing and wonderful experience on the whole. Now, long before I, we sent him to Outward Bound, um, I had studied up some Outward Bound. Now, for those of you who might not be familiar, Outward Bound is a organization that provides outdoor wilderness adventure experiences uh, for young people, and although they have also expanded that, they, they don't just do young people, they do elderly people, and they do veterans groups, and they do trauma survivors groups, and they do uh, alcoholic anonymous groups, and, and things like that. So, um, Outward Bound was founded by a, uh, a man named Kurt Hahn, and his story, uh, at least his philosophy, is worth sharing at least a little bit about. Kurt Hahn had a very particular philosophy of education. And this is where I got the title for my sermon this morning. Kurt Hahn believed, and he's writing this even in the 1930s, that modern culture was raising a thoroughly inadequate generation of young people. He believed that all the wonderful and ideal human qualities were already forcefully and very forcefully present in very young people children, curiosity, wonder, initiative, and a readiness and a willingness for love and bonding, a fine moral compass, and so on and so on. But right about you know, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, right at the moment when a child is finally sort of physically, mentally, emotionally able to and ready to participate in the life of their family and their community, and in times past, that was what was expected, right? You know, people growing up and uh, in their communities and families would start helping out with the, with the chores and with making a living and supporting the, the families. But right at that moment, in our culture, they are deprived of that opportunity. Instead of being nurtured and taught in the actual meaningful work of the family and community, they're shuttled away to mostly impersonal institutions, we call them schools, who have, that have no obvious relevance to any higher purpose, to their own natural gifts, or to their own deepest knowledge. He called this period of life in modern youth, he called this, this is the misery of unimportance. He believed the whole system, and especially the assumptions behind the system, completely ignore the natural growth of human beings into what we might idealize they would be, into becoming citizens of resilience, depth, and strong moral character profoundly connected to their communities. He believed that pushing our adolescents into the misery of unimportance, I say this with just a little hesitation because I have two teenage boys at home. It's kind of personal. He said, believe that pushing adolescents into the misery of unimportance resulted in youth who were soft, lazy, obstinate, <laughs> self-absorbed, and incapable of good judgment. <laughs> So glad I know it's not my fault. <laughs> Outward Bound came out of a specific experience that Kurt Hahn had in, uh, in the early years of World War II. He was, he was living in England at the time, and the English merchant shipping industry had a problem. Ships, merchant ships were being sunk by German, war, by German warships. And there was this observation that, or there was, a, there was an effort to try and preserve more of the sailors because oftentimes they were drowned. So Kurt Hahn was brought in and asked to look at the situation and make some recommendations. And, and he noticed that, uh, that the people who would drown, the sailors who would drown, were not the people you would expect to drown. You would expect who would survive would be, you know, the young, strong, healthy young men. Uh, and, but what often happened is those young, strong, healthy men would drown, 
And the ones who would survive would be the older, seasoned, maybe not nearly in as good a shape, uh, men who were on those ships. And Kurt Hahn um, determined that the, that the problem was a lack of confidence rather than a lack of any particular skill or equipment. He thought the younger sailors had not yet developed an understanding of their own physical, emotional, and psychological resources. So they didn't tend to make good decisions in a crisis. They didn't tend to keep their heads. They didn't tend to, they, they, they were the ones who tended to panic. So he devised this training for merchant sailors that would help them survive. He believed in experiel, experiential learning and the whole outward bound philosophy is built around this idea. So I was reflecting on this phrase, the misery of unimportance. And even if you think Kurt Hahn's educational philosophy was a little extreme, there is something, there is something deeply truthful in observing that a lack of a sense of purpose, a lack of a, a lack of obviously belonging, a lack of being able to clearly and concretely contribute our gifts, our talents, our lives to something that is larger than ourselves. There's something deeply truthful in, well, just acknowledging that those absences are one of the great tragedies of human life. So I was reflecting on this phrase, the misery of unimportance, and it brought to mind another phrase that Viktor Frankl, an Austrian psychiatrist, and I love this, called <laughs> existential frustration. <laughs> we all know this phrase. Even if, well, even if we don't know the phrase, we know the feeling, right? Frankl was another interesting thinker with a tragic and an interesting life. He was a prominent Jewish psychiatrist in Vienna before the Second World War, and his, it was his experience in Nazi concentration camps where he spent three years, uh, the concentration camps that killed his brother, his parents, and his pregnant wife. And his own experiences there uh, within himself and watching what happened to the other uh, uh, inmates there shaped all of his later work. He was already, uh, when, he, when he was arrested, he was already an expert in suicide and depression. And he noticed something in the camps. He noticed that there was a, there was a time, and you could almost see it coming, in these, in these indescribably horrific conditions. But there would come a time when he would notice that certain prisoners would just quit, would just stop, would just reach the end of what they could endure, and would just stop. They just would not give up, get up, and oftentimes, uh, they would just simply die, sometimes within an hour, usually within a day. But there were other uh, inmates, there were other prisoners in the camps who would just keep going, no matter what, just keep going and going. And, and so he's asking himself, you know, as a psychiatrist, what is the difference? What is it with, you know, one person who stops, and another person, same conditions, that never stops. After the war, he developed a branch of psychiatry called logotherapy. Based on the idea, this was his conclusion from his experience in the camp, based on the idea that the primary drive, the very primary drive at the core of our humanity is not the pleasure, not the drive for pleasure or sex, as Freud had said, and not the drive to power, as Adler had said, but it is the drive to find or create meaning in life. And that, he believed, was the core motivation at the heart of the human being, the drive to create or find meaning. And he said that was the difference in the camps. People who felt they had something to live for, whose lives had meaning, whose, whose time had meaning, could keep them going far past those who came to believe that there was no meaning. 
which raises some, which raises a wonderful question. What is it that keeps us going? I mean, really, what is it that keeps us going? What is it that gets us up and out of bed day after day, even on those days where we just really don't feel like it's worthwhile? There are people in this room right at this moment who have shared with me in my office and in their living rooms, they've shared with me that the only thing that has kept them going for years on end sometimes, the only thing that has kept them going is knowing that their own death would cause other people pain. And that is the only thing, nothing else. That's a pretty thin thread to hold on to. But if that's what we got, that's what we got. Frankel, perhaps many of us, would understand this perfectly. Frankel believes we can endure just about anything, even the most morally degrading, emotionally torturous, physically abusive conditions imaginable, as long as we believe we have something meaningful to live for. He writes there are basically three ways or categories of meaning in humankind, and he writes that this is one of them. It is we find meaning in love. In loving. Not necessarily in being loved but in the act of loving, in the act of appreciating, of wanting to care for or protect other human beings. Second, he says we find meaning in doing things. We find meaning in activity. We find meaning in getting our hands on something, changing something, working on something. Especially things that stir our creativity or, or speak to something that is deeper within us. Thirdly, we find meaning when we're able to turn our suffering to a larger or a higher purpose. Even when, or perhaps especially when facing a fate that cannot be changed or alleviated, at such times as, for instance, maybe dying from an inoperable cancer or some other situation. We can't change the situation, but we realize we have an epiphany that we can, in fact, change ourselves. So Franco says, existential frustration. Existential frustration happens when there is a tension or a discrepancy between who we are in our outward lives and who we believe we are in our innermost selves. Existential frustration. Or perhaps when the life we're actually living is not the same as the life that wants or needs to be lived within us or through us. Which in my, which in my experience at least this is pretty much all of us. Anybody not know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Frankl says, everyone experiences existential frustration. This is not neurosis in and of itself. This is not neurosis in and of itself. What he says is that when existential frustration becomes too great, when the gap becomes too great, or the pattern of existential frustration comes to actually define us, that is what leads to the various forms of mental or emotional illness, depression, dissociation, despair, anxiety, rage, phobias, compulsive, compulsive disorders, and so on. And that made me think of something else. That made me think of uh, an article I came across a few years ago, there was a hospice nurse, there is a hospice nurse, she's still alive, her name is Bronnie Ware, and she was someone who spent years with people who were in the very last stages, uh, the very last days of their lives. She wrote a book called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. Came out of her conversations in the hospice care of people who were in the last days of their lives and, and asking them, you know, do you have any regrets? She wrote this book about what they are the top five regrets of the dying. Here they are. Number one, 
I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself instead of what others expected of me. Number one. Number two, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. So this is especially true of men. It's true of women as well, but it's especially true of men, she says. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Number three, I wish I had the courage to express my feelings instead of keeping it all inside. <coughs> Number four, I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. And number five, I wish, I wish I had let myself be happier. Isn't that interesting? The people at the end of their lives come to this realization that happiness is actually a choice we make. I wish I had, I wish I had let myself be happier. So here's something I learned just a couple of weeks ago, and I learned it from Jane McGonigal in her brilliant TED talk about the healing power of games. She talked about how people who have gone through trauma of one kind or another, and she shares a trauma that she personally went through, but people who have gone through trauma of one kind or another, injuries or victims of violence or other crimes, illnesses, even terminal illnesses, sometimes, not always, but sometimes, these instances of trauma become the catalyst for tremendous personal growth. So it turns out that in addition to all the extensive studies that are out there about post-traumatic stress, there's a growing body of research out there about post-traumatic growth. So here are the five things that people who have experienced post-traumatic growth tend to say about their experience. Number one, post-traumatic growth people say, my priorities have changed, I'm not afraid to do what makes me happy. Number two, they say, I feel closer to my family and friends. I understand those relationships more and how much I need them. Number three, I understand myself better. I know who I am now. Number four, I have a new sense of meaning and purpose in my life. Number five, I am better able to focus on the goals of my dreams. Isn't that interesting? Doesn't that sound familiar? Because it should sound familiar. Those five things, those are the exact inverse and opposite of the top five regrets of the dying. Isn't that interesting? To go a little deeper with this, Viktor Frankl uses an analogy of a tree. He says, now as far as we know, and this was actually pointed out to me uh, between the two services, they, they think, well, I won't go into that. I don't have time. Sorry. <laughs> Frankly, he's the analogy of the tree. He says, as far as we know, no tree has ever had a, an existential crisis of meaning. I mean, maybe they have, but as far as we know. No, to Frankel, the answer was no. No tree has ever experienced a crisis of meaning or experienced existential <coughs> frustration. And that's because like trees, plants, animals, like they, they, they do what they have to do. They can do no other. They are, their, their DNA, they're programmed to do what they do. That's what it is. The task for us, says Frankl, our task as human beings <coughs> is to be what we were born to be in the same way that a tree is born to be a tree. Now, for those of you who are students of Taoism, you'll notice this wonderful congruence between the Taoist teachings and what Frankl is talking about here. The task for us as human beings is to be who we were meant to be, in the same way that every tree is precisely the tree that it was meant to be. The other thing, you know, we, we, but human beings, right, we get ourselves all kinds of confused about who we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to be. The other thing Frankl says, the other way of getting closer to the root of things is to recognize that we as human beings, we always have choices. We always have agency. We always have the ability to respond in different ways. Maybe not 
We don't have the same, we have a different level of freedom than a tree, right? So he says, keep in mind, this is Frankel talking, he said, remember meaning is not an end to be sought after. You can't get at it that way. Remember, meaning is always a, a byproduct right, of being who we were born to be, doing what we were born to do, being who we are in the same way that a tree is a tree. And if we do that, then meaning is inherent and needs no further comment. Very interesting. He says, so in any given situation, he says, Never ask, like, what's the meaning of this? What does this mean to me? Frank always say, that's a meaningless question. Okay? Don't ask that. He says, ask instead, what am I called to do right now? He said, imagine that all the forces of the universe have conspired. Everything that's ever happened to you in your life has conspired to bring you right here right now, in any given situation, and your, your, your task is not to say, what does this mean? Your task is to say, okay, here I am. What, is the, what am I called to do? How am I called to respond? What is being asked of me in this moment, in this precise situation? This may require some soul searching. The answer might not be obvious, but Frankl says this is the path that leads to meaning and wholeness and peace. So that reminded me of an old uh, parable. I no longer remember where I saw it. But it's a, the parable of the two dogs. So an old dog is going around one day and it comes across a young dog. And the young dog is chasing its tail with great enthusiasm, chasing his tail around and around and around and around. And the old dog says, what are you doing? And the young dog stops for a moment and says, oh, I'm so glad you asked. I am a really, really smart dog. I have mastered philosophy. I have explored the issues of being a dog to places that no other dog has ever gone before, and I have determined that happiness is a fine thing for a dog, and that happiness is my tail. <laughs> so I'm chasing my tail, and when I catch it, I shall be happy. <laughs> and the old dog says, huh. You know, I have also pondered some philosophical issues in my time, and, and I, I agree with you. I, I, I think you're onto something. I agree with you that happiness is a fine thing for a dog, and I agree with you that happiness is my tail. But I have observed over time that when I chase my tail, it runs away from me. And when I go about my business, it follows after. <laughs> Amen.
Our closing affirmation is printed on your, the front of your order of service. We read this in unison at the close of every service on Sunday. Our congregation is dedicated to the proposition that behind all of our differences and beneath all of our diversity, there is a unity that makes us one and binds us forever together in spite of time and death and the space between the stars. We pause now in silent witness to that unity. Oh 